Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 17th of December. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 20th of December and this last week ahead of 2021. It's certainly been another interesting week. We haven't really seen an awful lot of direction after the gains of the last week when we saw a fairly decent rebound, albeit tempered towards the back end of the week over concerns over new travel restrictions, new restrictions more broadly. But nonetheless, we've managed to hang on to most of the gains that we saw from last week. And obviously, we're also coming off the back of some important central bank meetings this week. And I think one of the key takeaways um, from this week's events and the central bank meetings is that there is rising concern amongst central bankers of the, the effects of inflation and the durability of inflation. And I think no, you know, no, no better was that borne out by this week's decision by the Bank of England to finally pull the trigger on that 0.15% rate rise that they should have done in November. Um, and finally did in December. And, you know, maybe the, the IMF's criticism of them to get on with it was just the shot across the bows that the bank needed. But the, the timing was still curious because we had, you know, a number of policymakers earlier this month and at the end of last month talking about the fact that now was not the time to even think about raising interest rates. So, and that was Catherine Mann who actually came out and said that in a speech at the end of November. She says, now is not the time to think about raising interest rates, let alone the timing of an interest rate rise. And then we had Michael Saunders um, earlier this month talking about the fact that he was starting to become a little bit uncertain about the wisdom of perhaps raising rates, given what's happening with the Omicron variant. And yet here we are on a Friday. Here I am talking to you um, in the aftermath of a Bank of England rate rise. And perhaps that CPI print of 5.1% was another nudge that the Bank of England needed to get on with it. Because ultimately, um, you know, what's the downside of nudging rates higher? It basically boosts the bank's credibility in terms of um, its inflation mandate. And the fact that CPI hit 5.1% now against the bank's expectation, the central bank's expectation that it would hit it in April next year, um, was maybe the smack in the chops that they needed to jolt them out of their complacency. It's certainly welcome. And certainly the, you know, the, the, the sky didn't fall in when they did it. In fact, you know, it, it, it was a relief that they actually finally decided to bite the bullet and, um, you know, raise interest rates. And as we can see from the FTSE 100, hasn't had any significant effect. The pound's been fairly solid. I think the bigger question now in the wake of that, and obviously the Fed's decision to taper its asset purchase program um, more aggressively, um, from January, $30 billion from 15, means that um, the Federal Reserve will cease its bond buying program by the end of March next year. And now the big question is, how many times are they going to raise interest rates? And the dot plot suggests three next year, three the year after. However, um, while that may be their intention, if you look at um, UK and US bond yields, five-year yield, or two-year yields rather, um, markets don't believe them. Let's look at the US two-year. Okay, so we've got a very sharp rise since September from 0.2 to 0.6. Obviously, the Fed funds rate is between 0 and 0.25%. Um, the upper bound is 0.25%. Um, the Bank of England's base rate is now 0.25%. Yeah, if we look at the two-year yield, um, we're talking, the markets are only pricing in another 30 or 40 
30 or 40 um, basis points over and above um, where we are now in terms of the upper bound. So I think the market's skeptical that the Federal Reserve will be able to hike by three times next year. And ultimately, so am I. Certainly six, six, six rate hikes in the next two years. If we look at the five year, um, that tells an even um, starker story. And then if we look at the 10 year, it's, it's the same. This looks to me like a potential topping pattern for US five year yields. You know, we're talking about 1.3%, 1.2%. That looks like a potential left shoulder. That's a head. That's a potential right shoulder. We've got a little bit of a neckline through here. And people will say to me, well, why are you using technical analysis on you know, bond yield charts? Well, you know, a bond yield chart is just representative of a price chart. It's just basically inverted. Why would you not? It certainly gives you an indication of market pricing when you look at a five-year yield, if you look at a two-year yield on different markets and if you look at the two-year yield on the UK again we've got lower highs and then we've got a very decent support level in and around 0.4 percent so certainly the bond markets aren't pricing an aggressive rate hiking cycle when it comes to the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve and that would probably suggest why equity markets are still fairly resilient despite this week's hawkish turn from central banks saying that you're going to look to raise rates three times next year is one thing being able to do it is something completely different so at the moment central banks are looking past omicron um, cases are surging yes it's true but so far hospitalizations are still at a fairly low level and the only death that we've had here in the uk was from an unvaccinated um uh, was, was was someone who was unvaccinated and was in their 70s. So at the moment, um, despite the high infection rate, despite the increased restrictions, which have seen obviously hospitality and leisure, the leisure sector get another hit um, this week, um, you know the 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 omens, if I can use that word, um, or the outlook, you know. That there are there are signs of encouragement in terms of what it may look like as we head into January, but of course it's very very early days as I sit here in my home office talking to you right now. So what are we going to be looking forward to in the week leading up to Christmas? Well, there's not an awful lot on the docket, and what is there is likely to be fairly um, confirmatory, if you like in terms of what we already know about the UK and the US economy. Obviously, we've got final GDP numbers from the UK, third quarter. Um, that's expected to see no change to the previous adjustment of 1.3%. Um, we may see a slight upward revision. We may not. Obviously, um, the third quarter includes July, August and September. And obviously, in August, we had the pandemic. Obviously, that then rolled off in September. So you might see, you might see a little bit of an upward adjustment in that as the pandemic restrictions got relaxed and people were able to return to some semblance of normal and the schools went back. Um, private consumption still expected to remain resilient on that. Um, manufacturing, particularly new car production, is likely to continue to remain a drag. Certainly only today, European new car registrations fell to another record low. Um, we've got third quarter GDP from the US, and again, this is likely to see um, a reiteration of what we saw um, a few weeks ago, uh, an upward revision to 2.1%. This isn't expected to change in the final adjustment this week. It's a significant weakening from the 6.7% annualised number that we saw in Q2, but nonetheless, it's not really expected to sort of shine anything new in terms of what the US economy looks like. And we also have the the Fed's preferred measure of core PCE inflation, core PCE deflator. And this is expected to move higher in November. Um, we're expected to see that move up to 4.5% and levels last seen in 1990. And obviously this week we saw UK retail prices it's 7.1%. And obviously that seven number is 
one particular figure that's probably going to resonate in the public finances, UK public finances numbers, which are due to be released on Tuesday morning. Despite the end of furlough in September, public sector borrowing has continued to remain high. It has dropped sharply from the levels that we saw at the end of the first and second quarter. But um, in October, um, we fell back to 18.8 billion pounds from, you know, two point, down, down 2.9 billion from the same month a year ago. So that's still fairly high, despite the fact that furlough, to all intents and purposes, had ended. And I think one of the reasons this number was as high as it was in October was because of higher interest payments due to higher RPI inflation. RPI is around about 6.6%. Then it's now 7.1% now. Higher spending on vaccine booster doses is also likely to boost the, um, the amount of money that the UK government borrowed in November. So I'm not expecting to see any significant change in that number and we should expect to see a number in the region of around about 20 billion pounds. And I say that's that's due out on the Tuesday. But again, you know, this high public sector borrowing, UK, US, Europe, everybody's doing it. So, you know, we're not exactly an outlier in that regard. So what does this mean for the markets overall in general? Well, we do appear for the moment in cable to be carving out a base in around 130, 160, 132. We can see that on this chart here. This is the same cable chart that I've been using for the past few weeks. And regular viewers of my videos will know that, um, you know, I've been talking about this 130, 160, 132 area for a while now. We've hit the bottom of the channel. We need to break through 134. Why 134? Um, well, obviously we, this is when the Bank of England hiked rates yesterday. Um, we weren't able to get above 134. It also coincides with this, this, these two lows here, around about 134.10 back in September. So between 134, 134.20, we really need to see um, a break to the upside from there. And I think the only way that we're probably going to see that pan out is if we see a significant weakening in the US dollar. And certainly I think one of the key takeaways that I've seen from some UK policymakers, Bank of England policymakers, is whether or not we get a rate hike in February. Certainly Hugh Pill, the new chief economist, does appear to be one of the more hawkish members of the MPC. And he's certainly um, laid his cards out on the table earlier today with some comments which suggest that if inflation continues to go higher, and the likelihood is that it will, um, the Bank of England is projecting 6% by April, which is not that far away when you consider that only two or three months ago, we were around about 3% and we're now at 5.2. So, and we were at 4.2 um, a month before that. So 4.2 to 5.1. You know, those are pretty exponential rises. And while you can argue that um, those energy price rises um, will eventually drop out, the fact of the matter is, we've still got potential further upside pressure in the weeks and months ahead, judging by what PPI has been doing. And PPI generally tends to be a fairly good leading indicator for CPI going forward. So 134, 10, 20, this sort of line here, um, if we can get back above here, then we could well head back towards 136. But I'd want to see a significant weakening in the dollar. And at the moment, we have seen a bit of a weakening in the dollar, which is encouraging despite the more hawkish tone. Um, and certainly um, euro dollar um, doesn't look at the moment as if it's showing any inclination of breaking out of its recent range. Again, we can look at this chart here, 113.85, that's that peak there. Um, it's still struggling to get back much above that. And we've got 111.85 on the downside. If we go all the way back here, we've also got this series of lows through here, which is around 111.60. So big, big level at 111.60, 111.80. Um, you know, if we do break below this series of lows here, we, I think we'd really need to break below 111.50 to suggest um, the potential for further downside. If we can get back through 114.20, then we could well head back towards this downtrend line from the peaks that we've seen back in June. 
Um, but as we head into year end, I'll be surprised if we see much in the way of significant moves in currencies either. Euro sterling, we did see um, a marginal spike lower yesterday, um, coincided with those lows back in August around about 84.50, um, but it's a big, big topper, 86, 86.20. And I don't expect that to change anytime soon. I still think the likelihood is we are range trading at the moment with a slight bias to the downside, given Lagarde's comments on Thursday that um, the ECB won't be looking to raise rates in 2022, whereas the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve probably will, um, probably by not as much as the markets are pricing, but certainly there is a higher likelihood of a rate hike from the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve next year than there is for the ECB. Um, and I think that's 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 the way I tend to look at currencies at the moment in terms of what those three central banks are likely to do going forward. We've also got US personal spending um, next week on the 23rd. That's likely to just bear out um, what retail sales data has been telling us. There's been an awful lot of brought forward spending, not only in the US, but also in the UK, we saw UK retail sales this morning coming at 1.4% for um, November. Um, with all the various restrictions that we've seen kick in over the course of the past week or so, December is probably likely to be disappointing in terms of high street, foot, foot, high street footfall. In terms of online, we may see a little bit of a pickup, but I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine that um, there'll be much in the way of a decent number for December retail sales in the US or the UK. I think an awful lot of consumers brought forward their Christmas spend into the October and November numbers, and that has been borne out um, by both prints in um, US and UK retail sales. In terms of earnings, we've got Nike. That's about the only item on the docket. Shares have done pretty well over the course of the past two quarters. Um, Factory shutdowns in Vietnam hit production earlier this year, meaning that the company wasn't able to meet demand. Um, however, that share price low proved to be fairly short lived, and we've hit record highs for the share price in November. Re revenues in Q1 came in at $12.2 billion. They were slightly short of expectations, and sales in China have slowed as the economy there has slowed. But since Q1, the Vietnam factories have reopened. The Chinese economy has picked up a little bit of speed. And Nike is also looking to get into the metaverse, which is probably one of the most hyper, 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 you know, most hyped ideas I've ever come across. But nonetheless, profits are still expected to come in at a fairly healthy 62 cents a share. However, given the way this price action has been trading over the course of the past few days, I would suggest the highs are in and we could well head back towards the 200 day moving average when these numbers are released on Monday. Okay, so um, let's have a quick look. Let's have a quick breeze through the various indices because I've left that till last. Um, FTSE 100 continues to look fairly resilient. We had a little bit of a spike lower um, earlier this week. Didn't last very long. Still of the opinion that while we're above the 50-day moving average in this line here, the line of least resistance is for further gains going forward. Um, obviously, airlines and travel and leisure have taken a bit of a hit um, this week. That's not surprising. But let's say, for example, Omicron basically behaves like a, um, a high powered firework and basically blows up in the short term in terms of infections, but then fizzles out very, very quickly because of the um, milder nature of the disease, even if it is more transmissible. Maybe January, um, we might see we might see a bit of a pickup. I think an awful lot will depend on the politicians' response to the events of the next two or three weeks. If I cast your mind back to January last year, it wasn't a particularly great start to the year for equity markets. We actually fell quite sharply. But if we look where we are now in terms of the market, you can see this is January. We went up and then we came crashing back down to earth again. Um, but since then, you know, since February, we've made some fairly decent gain, gains. And as we can see from this line through here, 
Um, there's a pretty decent floor on the FTSE 100 around about 6,800. We can draw if we can link these lows through here, then there's probably a low, uh, a decent support around about the 50 day moving average. So I'm still constructive when it comes to the FTSE 100. Probably less so on the S&P, but having said that, despite the fact that um, we've seen an awful lot of choppiness in recent days, again, we're still above the key support levels. And while this is rolling over, you know, I'll be surprised to see us move much below the 200 day moving average. Um, we did make a slightly new intraday high on the futures in the wake of the Fed decision. We've given an awful lot of that back. In fact, we've given pretty much all of it back um, as we head into the weekend. But overall, we're still pretty much well above the lows for this month. Um, what has been notable has been um, the volatility in the NASDAQ. But again, we're still above the lows for this month. If we take out those lows, then obviously we could well drift back down towards the 200 day moving average. But again, you know, the trend is still fairly positive. So nothing to get too anxious about. Um, you know, when, when you hear an awful lot of narrative about stocks being in a bubble, so on and so forth, yeah, it is a little bit concerning, but, you know, trade what you see, not what you hear. And for me, um, at the moment, we are still very much in a fairly decent range for the DAX. We have made obviously new highs in November, but the floor is very much around the 15,000 level. And until such times as we take that out, you really do have to remain constructive. But I would imagine that we're likely to continue to trade in the various ranges that we've been in for quite some time now. One notable factor has been gold prices, which appear to have broken out to the top side, but again, still within the wider range that they've been in over the course of the past few weeks and fairly decent support in and around 1760. As for Brent crude, um, that does appear to be still in its sweet spot. I talked about this last week. The sweet spot, I think, for OPEC is 65.75. That's pretty much where we are. And I think it's very much where we're likely to continue to be. So, you know, I think in terms of um, Brent crude, it's going, to pretty bit, it's going to be pretty much more of the same. So don't expect to see any significant changes there. So, as I say, this is probably going to probably going to be my last video for this year. I might do a quick one next week. I'm also publishing a whole host of um, written content, which will be going out over the course of the next few days, looking back at the year and looking ahead to next year. I'll be doing a piece on UK banks, be doing a piece on oil and gas and renewables. I'll be doing a piece on IPOs. I'll be doing a piece on the FTSE um, 100, the outlook for stock markets, and I'll be looking to doing doing a piece on currencies as well, and the outlook for the outlook for the the outlook, the outlook for the for the pound. So all in all, um, if I don't get to speak to you guys before, I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Thank you for your company this year. It's been a pleasure, and um, hope to see you all in the new year. Thanks very much for. Um, listening to my musings this year.